Now, Antifa is just one of the many far-left uh, groups we have in Australia. Obviously, there's the, the Socialist Alternative, and uh, down in Melbourne, we have the uh, campaign against uh, racism and fascism, which was responsible for a lot of the uh, protests we have down here. Now, Antifa, is it fair to classify them as having communist, uh, socialist, uh, philosophical ideas behind them? Yeah, that's uh, absolutely fair to categorise them as that. I mean, they they will often try to appeal to um, non-ideological people by hyping up the threat of the radical right. I mean, you know, obviously I think that there are some dangerous people on the radical right. I mean, there was that guy who was going to make a bomb and, and uh, you know, there's other kinds of things going on there but you know the, the state apparatus is going to stop that stuff it's not it's not going to be antifa but they they try and hype up these narratives in order to um to yeah try and sort of recruit people and yeah i think people can kind of get swept in that but by and large it's mostly um far left-wing ideologues like anarchists and communists and um and yeah they they i mean it's interesting um you know, I think I think at the time, if I was really honest with myself, the whole building the counter rallies and stuff like that, I mean, it's almost a great chance to recruit and to exert power and influence and kind of um, build strength for the radical left almost as much as it is about stopping the radical right. I had a, a sort of exchange with Slack Bastard and I queried him about the problematic nature of what happened at the Berkeley protest against Milo um, and where the university was burnt down and, and stuff like that and, and moderate right-wingers were even attacked. Um, and he sort of... I, I pointed out to him that this gave Milo more of a platform than the platform he was allegedly being deplatformed because all the media and the world's cameras were paying attention to the the rioter scenes and wanted to know what all the fuss was about and he got interviews in tv stations all across the world okay so his platform like if i got a pr firm and i sat down and i tried to work out how to give milo the biggest platform possible i couldn't come up with a better idea than what antifa did in berkeley right i, I can't conceive of a better way to get get him more attention but he sort of ignored that point. And I also remember when I was in the whole Antifa thing, I remember like a non-ideological friend said to me, don't these protests just give more attention to the radical right? And I just got angry at him because usually when you can't answer something and you get angry, it's a sign you're wrong, right? Um, Slack Bastard sort of just went, oh, well, even if that's the case, it's good that it brings the left together. And, and I think a lot of the time that the radical left secretly want there to be a radical right movement that's big and strong because it, it validates their, their meaning and purpose. And it's also a great recruitment, um, a, a way for them to kind of hype up, oh, look, see, the fascists are coming. You need to join us. We're going to stop the fascists. But if if there was a violent radical right, right wing movement um, that was like physically putting people in danger, it's the state apparatus that's going to stop it, not a bunch of communists and anarchists. And they do sort of do this uh, view of the West that it's, you know, based on a system of oppression and there's all these, you know, various victim groups. We've heard of the term uh, intersectionality, which is there's a hierarchy of oppressed groups. So it does also, uh, f apart, uh, f apart from, you know, all the, you know, violence and, you know, smashing fascists, they do, you know, subscribe to this, you know, identity politics, uh, politically uh, correct uh, cultural view. Yes, they do. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, it's so bizarre at the time, you know, it's so, it's so bizarre because both the radical left and the radical right kind of put the group identity above the individual, you know, and I could see how the radical right were putting, you know, these kind of abstract notions of like whiteness or whatever. But then at the same time, I couldn't see how the radical left was replicating the same kind of logic and that group identity comes before individual merit or the individual. 
So I, I don't actually buy this narrative that the radical left are uh, against racism and sexism. I think what they do is they go, they just replicate it in another way. So they become irrationally resentful of people in the oppressor group, right? So the people with privilege or whatever, which is the straight white male, um, regardless of that individual's circumstances or life, right? They just caricature them. And then they become sycophantic towards people they think are oppressed. So quite often in these radical spaces, um, you know, people would sort of, uh, yeah, sycophantically sort of agree with um, anything someone of, a, of an oppressed status would, would say or do and hold them to a much different standard. And, and I, I think that's a form of racism. And uh, I also think that I, I've got a good example of how this sort of plays out. So um, there was uh, like a, one of these radical left wing events, right? And there was this guy who was a gay guy and for 10 years had been campaigning for the gay marriage thing, right? So in my experiences, this was one of the more authentic people on the radical left. I mean, they they followed through and they, they did a lot of activity while a lot of people just sit around and they sort of have the right beliefies but don't do anything. Anyway, so there was a party and um, someone had an epileptic fit. And there was a disagreement between this individual and someone who identified as a trans indigenous woman who was blind, right? So they had like four special identity points, right? So they were the ultimate sacred being of the radical left, right? And instead of two adults having a disagreement over how, uh, pe how people should react in a medical situation, um, it turned into... Uh, that person was disagreeing with the, the trans blind uh, indigenous woman um, because he was a racist, sexist, transphobe, right? And they also have this thing of accusation equals verdict, right? Because to question an accusation of racism and sexism, whatever, would be helping the forces of racism and sexism, right? And so this person was banned from an anarchist social center, the Black Rose, right? And um, and so this person was gutted. This this activist was like quite hurt, and their reputation felt damaged. I mean, you have to keep in mind that this person's whole world is based in this subculture, and they wanted to respond to this accusation, and they weren't allowed to. Um, and this Black Rose organizing collective, whose job it was only to organize the uh, and facilitate the social center, had like five three or five meetings over the alleged guilt of this person, right? Right up into the phase where the bookshop's lease was about to end and their main job was to either renew the lease, get a lease in another venue and work out to do with all the property of the space. They left all that to the last day, but they yet, and they didn't have any meetings and they didn't organize that, but yet they found the time to have these, this bloody tribunal by a bunch of uh, dull bludging activists, right? And so I wonder to what extent as well that the whole racism and sexism thing and uh, and the way that that gets thrown, down, thrown around is a way for them to exercise power. So if I say that you're victimizing me, you know, I would then have a moral justification to go after you and attack you, right? So I think underneath a lot of this is some pretty pretty dark psychology. Uh, what the hell? And that, uh, that stemmed from a situation when all this a guy was trying to do was you know help help this you know person who was who was having a fit and yet, yet he gets uh, hauled before uh, this you know star chamber, which leads on to my you know next question. A lot of a lot of the talk of when we see you know the you know, vi uh, violence and a lot of the aggression that comes from Antifa is, you know, if that's how they're behaving now, what would uh, a society run by them look like? Well, what is their, you know, perfect society? You know, how, how would they like to see, um, you know, Australia run, for example? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're sort of utopians, you know what I mean? And, um, I mean, I think the society that they would run would be a, would be a nightmare. You know, but just like the radical right, right can um, has like a utopian vision of the ideal ethno state or whatever. Um, they, the radical left too, lives in a fantasy world that's unachievable. 
So they believe that, um, you know, that, 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 you know, that the human, that we're all going to live in some sort of democratic, you know, <laughs> giant communes or whatever, and all eat breakfast together. And, um, man, it would be a nightmare. I mean, they kind of, what they do is they take a, a few, like, values and, and stuff, but they don't have, they have the wrong hierarchy of values. I mean, truth is way down the bottom there. And when you believe, you know, that moral trolley experiment where you pull the lever, there's, there's uh, two tracks and a train's coming. The, the train could run over four people tied to a track or you could pull the lever and, and kill one person on the track to save the four, right? Okay, when you have an ideology that will create abstractions of, of images of how the world is, um, you can then believe that um, by pulling that lever and hurting that one individual, you're, you're saving the many. And you can, you can follow that process onward. So I reckon that they, they could justify mass murder pretty much based on that narrative. And, um, you know, even, you know, like I'm not necessarily down for racism and sexism, but, I mean, I think the way that they define it is, is, is wrong. And then secondly, I think that, you know, by, re, by taking the mainstream value of being against racism and sexism, redefining it gives them a moral high ground that isn't earned. But then it also gives them a justification to bully someone. And then it's like the moral trolley experiment. It's like, okay, that person, that working class person said the word cunt. That means they hate women. That means they're a sexist. That means I'm justified in bullying them. And that means m me bullying them isn't bullying them. I'm helping usher in a new society because I'm fighting against the evil forces of sexism. You know, keep in, keep in mind we have the same brain as we had in the Stone Age or maybe even smaller. So, you know, it, it's like how ancient people believed in spirits. Like, they see the spirit of racism and sex. This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment, and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.